so everyone, I am, I am Larissa Kautz from Melwood, um, and I have the great privilege and honor of introducing you guys to our next two amazing panelists. Um, we have Rob Burton, who I was told is from Crawl and Mooring and not Crowell and Mooring, <laughs> which I think everyone assumes that it is. Um, Rob has been working in the government contracts group, uh, but before that he was a 30-year veteran of procurement law and policy development. He served in the executive office of the president as the deputy administrator of the Office of Federal Procurement Policy, uh, one of the, the nation's basically top career federal procurement official. Um, prior to joining OFPP, he spent over 20 years as a senior acquisition attorney <laughs> with the Department of Defense. Um, and to the right of Rob, we have Anne Rung, who we're honored to have with us today. She's the director of the government sector at Amazon Business. Um, before coming to Amazon, she had a career uh, as a federal procurement <laughs> official as chief acquisition officer in the Obama administration um, from 2014 to 2016. She was responsible for implementing acquisition policies covering $450 billion in annual federal contract spending. <coughs> She also served as the Chief Acquisition Officer at GSA and the Senior Advisor at the U.S. Department of Commerce. Um, prior to joining the administration, she was the Deputy Secretary of Procurement for the state of Pennsylvania and also worked for former Vice President Joe Biden when he served as Chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee. Um, and I would way like Way back when. <laughs> way back when. Um, so I will, I will start chronologically since we have some folks that were serving in similar positions under two different administrations. And I'd love to hear from Rob about what was the perception um, of the Ability One program when he served at OFPP, and um, how has that changed over the years, and what has your experience been with the program? Sure, thank you so much for having me. I very much appreciate the opportunity to speak to you folks. I want to congratulate you on, what, 80 years serving uh, the United States government, which is very exciting. And um, time flies, right? So it's been 10 years since I was in the government, and when I was in the government, uh, a lot of the problems that you currently have um, you didn't have, you know, back then, partly because all these reports had not come out yet. So we have GAO, we have DODIG, we have Ability One um, IG. Uh, that was some, that's something new um, with respect to the theme that you need more oversight. So uh, this is sort of a government theme that you never can have too much oversight. So I think, uh, I think you guys were somewhat immune to uh, some of these themes. Um, and no longer, and you no longer are. Um, there's no question that federal procurement is different than commercial contracting. Uh, it is a public policy objective to help small businesses. It's a public policy objective to help ser ser seriously uh, disabled folks and blind. I mean, this is, uh, this is one reason federal procurement exists. Well, some people don't want to admit that, but um, it's very important it was very important when I was at uh, the Executive Office of the President. We were, we were very engaged with uh, NIB, and then back then it was called NISH. Um, we were very engaged with respect to increasing opportunities, and, um, and for small businesses as well. And quite frankly, I think every administration uh, is going to embrace that notion. I think it's uh, good politics. That's the first thing I learned. You know, I grew up in the Department of Defense, and then I show up, at the executive office of the president. And you know the first thing they taught me was, look, we run the federal government, OK? OMB, the Office of Management and Budget, we run the federal government, not the Department of Defense. I had been taught the Department of Defense ran the federal government. <laughs> you know? And I was quickly so educated, that. right? I was quickly yeah. educated that 500 people at OMB run the federal government. And there's some truth to that, actually, although DOD will never admit that. Um, and so these, um, the challenges, I think the challenges that you uh, guys face are fairly significant now because there is much more criticism um, from different sectors, the oversight community, if you will, uh, thinks you need more oversight, and they're there, and they're there to help. Um, I think it's the same thing a, a lot of agencies have struggled with uh, with respect to um, having more competition, you know, making sure that uh, you have quality products. A lot of these um, um, questions that are now being raised about the Ability One program are really fairly new because back uh, when we were running uh, the, the government, um, uh, there wasn't so much this type of concern that has been brought to the forefront really starting in 2013 with the GAO report. Um, coming in and raising questions, and now you have 
uh, a whole panel, right, the Section 898 panel, who, uh, which are um, guru, gurus making recommendations on how to improve things. And you have a lot of recommendations there, and I think maybe we should spend some time later talking about some of those recommendations on how they might impact um, everything you do. But I, th I think one of the things I was struck by, and I'm still struck by, when I was in government, and also now that I'm in the private sector, I find that a lot of small businesses and the nonprofit uh, agencies tend to um, never, they're never, there's, there's never cohesion. There's never cohesion among the interests, and you all have very similar interests. And I always found it interesting when I was at um, OMB, I would have the Hub Zone people come in, I'd have the 8A people come in, um, the women owned folks show up. And I spoke to all of these groups, and you know, to me, they were almost competing. They were competing among each other, right? They were competing among each other. Um, uh, and I think back in the, back in those days, my perception, at least, was that the nonprofit agencies were somewhat immune to this. I think my prediction is you guys are going to be probably right in there uh, with the mix more so now than than ever. And my advice to to you all, and um, the small business community also is it really, now more than ever, you do have to advocate for yourselves. Um, Washington's all about advocate, advocacy. And I think to the extent you look at some of these recommendations coming out of the 898 panel, some of them you might like, some of them you probably don't like, you, do ha you can't be silent. You cannot be silent. And I also learned when I was in government that you have an enormous amount of political power. Uh, and I always thought, you know, I was so naive when I was growing up, I thought there was no, you know, Procurement is nonpartisan, right? It's totally nonpolitical. Well, that's another thing they educated me on when I showed up at OMB. No, politics affects everything. Politics, believe it or not, does impact the federal procurement system. And so um, what I learned was people that advocate effectively do well in Washington. And so I think, I think, um, I think this is one thing I think the small business community as well as the nonprofit agencies really sort of need to cohesively come together and really advocate in a way that's probably more effective than it was back when I, when I was in, uh, in government. I will say this too with respect to my experience now in the um, commercial world because <clears throat> you always wonder what do people think of you, right? And I have some great clients who actually use nonprofit agencies in a big way. And I have actually been at these facilities and had tours. It is amazingly impressive. And I think uh, some of our government officials would do well to go actually visit some of these facilities and see exactly what, is, what, what are the nonprofit agencies doing for the Department of Defense. These are uh, clients who serve the Department of Defense primarily. And they have eight, eight agencies actually in their facility doing more services, not, not manufacturing, but more services in a very impressive way. And uh, they, they, you know, they were all very, I mean, just they, they give the company a, a really good image too. When you talk to these people on the floor and see what they're doing and actually engage with them, very impressive. You cannot do anything more to get a good PR, if you will, than have government officials uh, actually visit uh, plants and see what nonprofit agencies are doing for the Department of Defense as well as the federal government. And so I think there's, I think a lot of uh, folks in the private sector are very impressed with what, what's going on, what you guys, the contributions that you're making. So Rob, if any of your clients need any subcontractors, we have Melwood and Service Source and Chimes right here ready. <laughs> <laughs> Happy to jump in. <laughs> Can you remind me what the question was? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so the question was about your time um, at OFPP and about your experience with the Ability One program oh, yes, and also yes. the perceptions of the program. Yeah, I mean, I uh, having been in the private sector for a couple of years now, I think the Ability One program is one of the things that distinguishes government from private sector. It's using public sector dollars to drive important socioeconomic outcomes. I first came across a program similar to this at the state level when I was Deputy Secretary of Procurement in Pennsylvania, and it was called, well, then we worked with the Pennsylvania Industries of the Blind and Handicapped, which I don't know how it's linked to the national program, if at all, but it's interesting to me that every state has a very similar program. And the kind of issues we were working through with the legislature around that program 
It was really around, I think, a lot of education and um, really trying to sort of define the parameters of how to best use, use these companies. At the federal level, um, when I was uh, in the Office of Federal Procurement Policy, I had the utmost respect for Tina Ballard, who ran the commission. And I think my, my thought at the time was that um, it's, how do I say this? It is a, I think, challenging organizational structure. Like, I didn't entirely understand it, and I'm not sure I entirely understand it today. I mean, it's, and I think it can be frustrating for the people in the organizations as well, because you have sort of a national commission, then you have central nonprofits, then you have nonprofits. Um, and how do they all interact? And are we, are, are we all aligned? And um, I've been working closely with these groups over the last few years since I came to Amazon because I love the mission so much that when I started at Amazon, I met with Tina to say, we should partner. Like This could be an incredible way to help drive better outcomes for the program. And I think, um, I think this program will always be in a good place if we never forget that we're driving towards the outcome of increasing employment opportunities for the blind and the disabled. That is the purpose of the program. It's not to protect turf. It's not to, um, you know, it's not about the infighting. It's not about, it's not about the processes. And I think what I'm interested in challenging folks around is um, let's focus less on the processes. They've been around for a while. And let's focus on the outcomes. And maybe there's a different way to drive those outcomes. <coughs> I think that's, that's where my head is at for the last few years around this program. Can you tell us a little bit about Amazon Business and, and the role that you hope that it could take in this program? Yeah, yeah. So Amazon Business is Amazon's marketplace for business customers only. So it has the same look and feel of the Amazon consumer site, but it's a platform built on top of that consumer site. And you register under your work email. It's a free registration. So our business customers are commercial customers, but they're also governments as well. So we have cities and counties and states and federal agencies and nonprofits using us. We also have healthcare customers, uh, schools, K through 12, uh, <laughs> universities using Amazon Business. And the whole idea of having a separate marketplace for businesses is that they require certain features that the consumers don't. So for example, they require multiple users. So when you onboard a federal agency, your purchase card administrator is going to want to onboard several thousand purchase card holders onto the site and manage that spending from a central account. Um, we have workflow approvals. So when you imagine that in the world of Ability One, you want to make sure you set up approvals to be monitoring that purchase before the actual purchase um, to ensure it's complying with the Ability One program. We have tax exemption features. We have quantity, biz, uh, quantity discounts, business pricing. Um, we have features like, um, we call it related offers report, but it ensures that you are receiving a certain amount of offers every time you search for a product. So in government, that's particularly important to be able to show and document that you received competition. And oftentimes, it's to prove that you received at least three offers. So I think the important thing to understand about our marketplace is that more than 50% of the sales do go to third-party sellers. And the majority of those sellers are small and medium-sized businesses. And so we allow for credentialing on our site uh, SBA credentials as well as national minority owned, woman owned, and we're out recruiting state credentialed small businesses as well. So I've heard rumors about a pilot program with the Ability One program. Yes, it was in the news. Yes, so we have been talking to the commission and uh, the two central nonprofits for the last few years about um, how to launch this pilot with the U.S. Air Force, which is a customer of ours on Amazon Business. And the idea is simply that we, um, we want to onboard the authoritative selection for Amazon Business and make it available to our federal customers. In this case, we'll make it available to the US Air Force. And we're launching it at uh, 12 bases, so a limited set of users. And we want to track and measure um, the success of that program, meaning um, are we seeing an increase in sales? Um, the Air Force is committed to generating spend reports 
um, on a regular basis that they can run against 50 or more data points, so down to level three data, so they can see the quantity, the prices paid, um, and they will ensure compliance by looking at those reports to see the products that were purchased uh, as Ability One products and those that were not purchased as Ability One products to see whether they should have been. Um, we're hoping to launch that soon. Um, I think you know we we have five or six measures in place to ensure that. Um, there's compliance with this program. Um, I'm really excited to launch it. I have this conviction that if we make the buying experience easy, if we make it like the Amazon shopping experience, we will increase sales to this program and we will increase employment opportunities as a result. That's my conviction, but I want to test that. Um, what other ways uh, do you think that Amazon can help increase the employment of people with different abilities um, in the workplace? Yeah, I mean, Amazon has, um, within its HR department, a team focused on hiring uh, the blind and disabled. So that's across the company at large. Um, but within the pilot where I am focused, I think we have sort of five or six measures in place where we want to ensure this program really works. And um, we understand that ensuring that we are only onboarding authorized Ability One sellers is one, one measure we have to put in place. Uh, so we have, for example, our gating, our Amazon gating team is uh, reviewing the sellers that want to offer Ability One ASINs against uh, the commission's authorized distributor and manufacturer list. Um, and then um, we're also, we will meet with the commission weekly to review that list to make sure these are authorized sellers as well. Um, we are, we created uh, a specific Ability One brand on our marketplace. And um, that means that when you go to search for the item, the description will begin by clearly stating Ability One product. Uh, we created what we call ASINs, <clears throat> which are Amazon standard industry numbers, but it's basically a product code around the Ability One <clears throat> products. And so, um, excuse me, I'm getting all choked up. It's so powerful. <laughs> um, so doing that, creating a specific set of products um, allows us to do things like gate um, the products to make sure they're being sold by authorized distributors. Um, and we've also created a landing page um, that allows the Air Force to more easily go to these Ability One products. They will feature only the Ability One products on the landing page. Do you have advice that, as you've been thinking about coming today, do you have advice for the NPAs in the room as to how they can strive to be more innovative um, and, and bring the work that they've been doing, whether it's products or services, into the current kind of federal procurement landscape? Yeah, I mean, what we're learning as we reach out to not just Ability One um, authorized distributors and sellers, um, but just small businesses in general, is that not everyone wants to scale. You know, and that's something that you have to understand that <clears throat> if you want to use an online marketplace, which I think is a very powerful tool to reach millions of buyers, in our case, um, you have to want to scale, and you have to think through what it means to be able to scale. And Amazon has a uh, seller central service, it's a self-service, to try to make it easy for you to onboard onto our marketplace, but with Small businesses, particularly small credential businesses, and certainly with the Ability One program, we're providing very hands on support to onboard our sellers and really teach them how to succeed on our site and scale. But it's not, you know, I don't just assume it's, it's going to be something you could easily do overnight. We, I think, oftentimes take for granted, like, just upload this document. Well, that may be challenging for a small business. Um, not all small businesses even have a website. <laughs> And so um, I think, you know, thinking through the technology needs um, and really asking yourself, like, do I want to scale and do I have the ability to scale? Um, and that's kind of the, the discussion we're having with, with our, with our um, small business sellers. I mean, I just wanted to comment that I think, uh, I think what Amazon is doing here is huge. You know, I think it is absolutely uh, going to be um, think about it. I mean, to be hooked up to this vehicle 
uh, for the nonprofit agencies, I think is just uh, going to be a paradigm shift. And I think that it's very exciting. And I think it's going to obviously result in increased sales to nonprofit agencies. Uh, I don't know that you could have any better marketing uh, in, in any other vehicle uh, than I can think of. So, uh, and hopefully other online marketplaces will pick up. Uh, yeah, pick I up, mean, uh, this is an example. I think one of the most striking things is that if you ask a government agency how much they spend with Ability One, they can't answer that question today. And you can't manage what you can't see. <coughs> And so I think at a very fundamental level, what we're trying to do is provide that trans sorry, transparency um, so you can run spend analytics across 50 different data points at any given time to see your ability one spending and what exactly you purchased. And if you're managing this program effectively, you can flag for when something should have been purchased through ability one. And that is not available to people today in any way, shape, or form. Agencies really struggle with this. Now, I will say one thing that struck me when I was at OFPP, and it's, I'm still convinced of it today, I see it with the Air Force, is that I think DOD has been one of the greatest champions of this program. And um, I firmly believe that if you provide an easy to use experience for government buyers, they will make the right decision. They are not seeking to break the law or not comply. They believe in this program, they want to comply, but it is just, we make it so hard for people to comply with the program. That's my fundamental belief. Well, I think that's a good segue to talk about the, the 898 panel, um, because some of the recommendations they make are to try to make it easier for contracting officers to understand when the Ability One procurement list is at play, um, how to figure out whether they're, they're, they need to go to this mandatory source or other places. Yeah. Um, and I'd love to ask both of you um, about your thoughts on, on some of these recommendations and how you see them, them changing the program. I'll let you jump in, Rob. Well, let me, uh, I, I, just to make sure we have a level set, I just wanted to highlight um, some of the recommendations from the Section 898 uh, panel. As, as you may know, this was in the 2017 uh, NDAA, you know, that's the only law that ever passes anymore is the National <laughs> <laughs> you, you all know that, right? You know, so if you want a law passed, you got to hook on to the uh, NDAA. Uh, but there are some really problematic recommendations here. Um, one is to require fair market, again, these are recommendations. The panel has been doing work and is making recommendations. One recommendation is to require fair market pricing documentation. One of the big heartburns of some of these IG reports that I re referenced uh, was that there's no documentation. There's not enough documentation so we can take a look at what's going on. Uh, so I think you're going to see more and more documentation requirements. So this is, and there have been allegations, right, that the prices are too high. You know this. And um, so the IG community wants to have documentations to sort of do an analysis to see is there fair market pricing uh, or not? Um, it's at least when the nonprofit agencies are negotiating with the federal government. These price negotiations, I think, are going to be something that's going to be looked at in the future. Documentation on disability determinations. A lot of uh, heartburn that some of the folks doing the work are not really disabled. Um, that um, you know, some people even use the word fraud. Again, the IG community loves that word. Um, and so you've got, this is another concern and recommendations regarding documentation on disability determinations. And big recommendation on increasing oversight and audits. Audits, that word audits shows up in the recommendations of NIB, of uh, Source America, now called Source America, and uh, all the nonprofit agencies. So increased oversight audits, one of the recommendations. And then, last but not least, is a recommendation I think we should talk about a little bit, which is more competition among the nonprofit agencies. Um, and I think this is really interesting. I think this is really going to be something you folks are going to have to sort of deal with in the future, because there is the view, and a lot of folks I've talked to in the government uh, with respect to perceptions, uh, think that um, the, the nonprofit agencies were a little bit complacent, were a little bit feeling like, hey, you know, we're sort of a mandatory source. Um, you got to come to us. And the IG community and these oversight folks are taking a look saying, well, um, we, we want to see some competition somewhere. Now, you know, you all know 
that um, the nonprofit agencies are exempt from the Competition and Contracting Act, from SECA. Um, they are specifically exempted from uh, SECA. What I'm seeing with these recommendations is sort of a, a desire to wedge the nonprofit agencies into a more competitive environment. Um, and so the recommendations of the 898 uh, panel include something that looks very much like you know, competition in the commercial, uh, in with respect to commercial companies, they want announcements similar to FedBizOps uh, for interested nonprofit agencies in the Ability One network. So we're going to have something. I'm going to call it who, what it's going to be called, but something similar to FedBizOps. They want justifications and approval, JNAs. Um, if there's only one nonprofit agency that can support a particular project, and you're basically going to do a sole source. The IG community is saying, "Where's the JNA? Where's the uh, where's the justification for that sole source, if you will, um, uh, um, procurement?" And so JNAs are going to be required under these recommendations. Again, these are just recommendations. Um, then, if you tr um, if in fact there's poor performance, you're getting in now some of the allegations with respect to the the um, the fact that some of the work has been at least in the government's perception inferior or poor then the recommendation is to transfer or recompete that work among the nonprofit agencies, uh, assuming that the Ability One Commission approves. Then there would be protection for the employees who, during the recompete process, to ensure that they don't necessarily lose their jobs, sort of the right of first refusal. These are huge recommendations, right, with respect to how the program could be different in the future. And my feeling is that these recommendations are trying to mirror image the regular FAR construct, if you will, for federal procurement. And it's going to be a mini federal procurement system over here that mirror images the big federal procurement system. And that's where it's a, it's a signal they want Rob to stop. <laughs> <laughs> and my phone's ringing at the same time. Yeah. Thank you, Donald Trump. But um, I think that's, uh, I think these recommendations are going to be taken seriously, and I think they could have quite an impact on the future of the uh, Ability One program. Uh, um, well, you know, I was talking about making the buying experience easier. I'm not sure about that. I, I would say, you know, I'm just curious, like, <clears throat> one of the interesting things I've learned at Amazon that I love is they talk about working backwards from the customer. <clears throat> so you don't, like, invent something, a technology, without starting with the customer. And then you work backwards from there. So, like, what's the customer problem? You talk to the customer. You talk to all different types of customers. And I just think, you know, before you sort of lay out a set of recommendations, you have to start with two sets of customers. One are the, are the employees. <laughs> right? The employees of the program, you're trying to uh, improve employment opportunities for the blind and disabled. So let's start with them and start with the buyers and work backwards from there. Uh, they don't feel like customer obsessed uh, recommendations, but, um, but actually I haven't read the report, so I, I shouldn't judge. Maybe there's more context. Um, but it doesn't feel like kind of more processes are as effective as sort of just like greater transparency. You know, like, like pricing will come and competition will come when you have that transparency and you have that ease of use. Um, and so, yeah. I think, that's a good, I think that's a good point. I think what the government has a hard time being innovative. They love the word innovation. Um, and you'll see that word in everything that they, they publish, innovate, innovate, innovation. Uh, they, they don't really like innovation. And what I see with these 898 recommendations is let me go back to what I do. Let me go back to the system that I understand. Let me go back to where I feel comfortable. I feel comfortable with all these FAR regulations. And you folks in the Ability One program just haven't had enough rules. You know, you just haven't had enough rules. Uh, at least ones not that look like what we're used to in our far world. Um, and so I really think that there's a move afoot based on some of these IG reports and some of the concerns about lack of oversight. There is a move afoot to have more regulation and more 
mm. um, traditional <clears throat> traditional procurement processes. I think it's a, a mistake because I think where the government needs to go is a less of all of this, less of all of this. And you do see an appetite for this on, at, in Congress, and, and there have been moves at least to make federal procurement more commercial-like. We've heard this for years, going back to 1994 with the Competition and Contracting Act. I mean, what, excuse me, FASA, um, the Federal Acquisition Streamlining Act. What was that all about? That was all about can the federal government try to do things in a little more efficient and easy way? Can we become more like the private sector? Well, it didn't go well. Um, these <coughs> recommendations were made. The law was passed in 1994. The FAR uh, Council implemented this in 1995, all of the uh, FASA uh, rules making procurement simpler. And back then, I can't remember the numbers. I think the 809, there's a, a panel called the 809 panel, which is looking at the acquisition <coughs> reform. They looked at the huge growth of FAR clauses now applicable to commercial item acquisitions. And I can't remember the numbers, but it's, it's like four times as many. A uh, FAR clause is now applicable to FAR Part 12 commercial acquisitions than there were back in 1995. That's not the right direction to go. I mean, I think uh, Congress is now seeing that maybe this is not a good idea. Maybe we should, in fact, try to simplify things and actually, for the first time, become more commercial-like. And this is where companies, I think, like Amazon can play a huge role in actually streamlining, making procurement more efficient, faster, all of these great things that is happening in the commercial world that the government just can't seem to get their hands around. You know, the government just can't mm. seem to quite do it. And um, I think, uh, I think really, the congressional leadership and also the folks at OMB need to take a hard look at. Yeah, those OMB at actually. I mean, they're a problem. Yeah, I, think I know. Is, you know, it's I, never been as good since we were. <laughs> <laughs> Leslie's amazing. But I think that. There's a growing appetite, let me just yeah. put it this way, a growing ap appetite for innovation and a, a jealousy almost about how the private sector can do things much more efficiently than the federal government. And the federal government, I think, would like to at least become a little bit more like you know, the, uh, the private sector. And I do believe that that view and that feeling is greater now than ever before. So this is an optimistic point of view that we may actually see some innovation uh, and I think that would carry over to your world into the Ability One program as well. Well, we have about 10 minutes left, so I'd, if there are any questions from the floor. I have a question. Okay. Um, this is a question for Amazon. So, right now, I haven't seen the beta or whatever is going on. So, let's just pretend. It hasn't been launched. Okay, yeah, well, whatever is going on behind the scenes, I know there's some, some stuff going on. Um, so, let's pretend that an Air Force customer and I log in. Mm -hmm. what, what appears on my screen, yeah. and what does that mean for me as a customer? And what are the expectations of me as a CEO out there on that platform, mm -hmm. um, expecting mm -hmm. to know what they need to do? So one thing I would say is um, we're in the micro-purchase spend space right now. And um, we're not a preferred supplier in that uh, Air Force contracting officers and purchase card holders can use any source. So we're not a required mandatory source, right? Um, well, the plan is for the Air Force to send out a email to the purchase card holders participating in the program. They would have a link to the Amazon business landing page for Ability One. So that's um, when that is sent out, you would click on the landing page, that link, you would come into the landing page and you'd see a storefront branded with Ability One. And all the products available to you would be Ability One products that you can search. Um, and it would only be from Ability One authorized sellers. As you purchase, um, there is, we set up the account with Air Force such that there is a purchase card administrator at the top of the org. There are sub-administrators with uh, organizational components below them. And at any given time, the headquarters, uh, headquarters sort of central account manager for Air Force can run a report against 50 or more data points to see what kind of spending is happening at any given point. And they can track Ability One spending against the product, the price paid, from which seller. Um, and they're going to use that to monitor compliance and growth with the program. You will see when you click on an Ability One product, 
you'll see the Amazon detail page. And it'll start with the word Ability One, and there'll be a brand, a logo, that the Ability One Commission will essentially manage through Amazon's brand registry program. So that's a program designed to provide tools to brand owners to ensure compliance and uh, proper management of their brand. So I think it's an important point that what you'll see looks just like any other Amazon shopping experience, except with the Ability One logo clearly indicated and the brand name. And there was quite a bit of effort into making that happen. So for example, uh, today when you search various sites for Ability One products, you don't always see a photo. Uh, there's no standardization or normalization of how the products are described. We spent a great deal of time uh, gathering the data from the commission and the central nonprofits about the products and trying to normalize that data and make them look just like any other product description on the Amazon site. So you'll, f I mean, it'll look, feel like an Amazon shopping experience, but it'll be clearly marked as an Ability One product. It's not yet launched, so yeah. Or will there be like, you know, let's put that on Amazon right now. There's all those like items. Yeah. Will those be on there? And will, could I could I get lost really easily? Um, and yeah. click on over to the rest of Amazon business that has yeah. essentially the same item. So if you click on the link and you're on the landing page, you will only have Ability One products available to you to search. Certainly you can search anywhere on the marketplace for paper towels. We have a feature that we may use um, that is, can lead you to preferred sellers and preferred products. So that is a way to guide the Air Force buyers to the Ability One products if we choose to use that feature. But I think part of what we're testing is when we send them to this landing page, um, is that sufficient to get them to easily find the Ability One products? So I think we'll be tweaking it, kind of how we best guide people to the products. Yeah, so your hand up first. I don't mean to make you uncomfortable by asking these questions. It's a two part, and I just yeah. thought with your experience, if you have any insight, yeah. you may have direct knowledge. But um, as far as the panel recommendations, I've heard everything. I've, <laughs> I've gotten every question. As far as yeah. the panel recommendations are concerned, it seems as though the competitive piece would be obviated by the fact that there had been more transparency in Source America with the selection process. And the part two is. To the extent Source America wants to position itself, at least in the cooperative agreement, as the default provider in the event it can't find a nonprofit to provide products or services, mm -hmm. how would that manifest itself if the program remained non-competitive in nature with Source America being the default provider under your... Um, so I'm not sure I understand the question entirely. <coughs> like um, The Ability One Commission has provided us the list of authorized distributors of Ability One products. So we are working to onboard the authorized list. Um, so does that tie into your question? If North America's not on that list as an authorized provider, or are they on that list? I assume they're on that list. Yeah. I think, yeah, um, I think this raises a real, I'm sorry. Yeah. Let me just uh, make this one point. I think. This is sort of interesting with respect to online marketplaces. A lot of people are confused about online marketplaces. They don't really understand exactly what they are even. But really, we are moving into a new era. I mean, this is all new technology. I mean, this is a new day. And the federal government's going to have some trouble, you know, trying to get used to these idea, the idea. And I give Congress credit. Uh, there was a section called Section 846 in the 2018 NDAA where Clearly, Congress saw the value of online marketplaces and sort of was encouraging government agencies to use them more frequently, no question about it. But, you know, this is a great example of where I, I talked about there seems to be a desire for innovation, there seems to be a willingness to go in that direction. And then at the same time, so now GSA is implementing that law, and here we go. You know, the government has this tendency, we haven't really seen the implementation yet, but but you can see signs that they're thinking about more procedures, government unique um, 
uh, conditions and so forth, and um, hesitant about commercial commercial terms and conditions. Maybe we should make it more government-like. Here's this this um, comp these competing policy objectives, right? On one hand, we want innovation. We would like the uh, online marketplaces to be used more for efficient procurement for low dollar value items, and yet there's this desire, I think, to to put in controls. And one of the things I'm concerned about, and one thing I'm hoping that the government does correctly, is not make what we call micro-purchases, which is now up to $10,000, more complicated. Because if the government makes it more complicated, it's going to affect uh, small businesses and it's going to affect nonprofit agencies as well if we complicate um, uh, micro purchases, which is now up to ten, will be if the if our former office implements the uh, law here, it will be the micro purchase level will be up to ten thousand for the entire federal government, uh, which I think is a great opportunity for nonprofit agencies and small businesses as alike. Um, but let's hope that we continue to make it easy. And a matter of fact, there are no rules that apply to micro purchases except for preference for Ability One products, and. Um, uh, and so far, I think it's worked well in the past. And so hopefully, um, as the government tries to innovate, it won't hurt that. Uh, We'd have to respectfully disagree. I don't think it does work. And I don't think the plan that Amazon is pushing forward, where you don't block and substitute with Ability One parts, if you don't do that, if you just rely on a federal cardholder to go to a landing site, they can already do that. And we already know of the problems associated with that. Yeah. In the 846 panel, there is a pilot program. And that pilot program has been going on for some time. If you look at the results, at least at two Air Force bases uh, in North Dakota and Kansas, there, year over year, there's a reduction in transactions of an average of about 22%. So we're seeing from this 846 pilot program that the Ability One base supply centers are not being served well by this legislation. Now, can that be overcome? I think it possibly Which, which can. legislation, 846? Yes, the pilot but, program. But the bases you're referring to are not Amazon business customers. Uh, they, yes, they are. McConnell Air Force Base and uh, Grand Forks. Oh, and you're seeing a reduction in Ability One purchases at the bases that are participating. In transactions at the base supply what, centers, which are operated by Ability One. And so you're with? I'm a contractor. With, with National Administrative National Industry Blind. for the Blind and National Association for Yeah, um, and so I would say, like, to, to make a statement it's not going to work, we haven't actually launched it. So, and that's the purpose of a pilot, is to test and measure it. And I hear you on block and sub. So one of the things we're testing is whether your theory is correct that federal contracting officers, when given a choice, will not comply with the law. No, and I'm, and my theory is, when given a choice, contracting officers will do the right thing, but we make it so hard for them to comply with the law, that's why your sales aren't growing. What I'm that's saying my is theory. just like the paper towels. They're going to search for paper towels. My, my theory first, is they're, they're going to make the right decision. Because they can do that today. What they're going to do is search for paper towels and whatever they'll buy whatever is in front of them. So if you don't have block I and substitute. I disagree. And that's well, why we're launching a pilot. How is that different from today then? I'm sorry? How is today, that different from today? Today, it is absolutely challenging to purchase Ability One products. The data we received from NIB and the commission was a mess. There's... A lot of them didn't have photos. There was no normalization of the data. People are struggling to figure out what they're buying. It's difficult to compare the data. There's no one place they can go. It's a painful shopping experience. So what we're testing is, if we make it easier for federal buyers to purchase these products, can we increase sales? That's what we're testing. And I'm not sure what the concern is. And I would say. Well, here's the concern. I would say. Let's try something a little bit different and focus on the outcomes rather than the processes that have been in place for probably decades. If I shop on Amazon today, I, mm -hmm. I put in an item that I want to buy, paper towels. Yeah. And it shows me different options for paper sure. towels. Yeah. If I have to go to a landing page before I can see Ability One paper You're towels. You're going to go directly to the landing page because we're going to send you the link. I'm shopping for paper and by the towels. way, there's no such one. thing as a closed marketplace today. I can be looking on GSA Advantage, and I'm only going to see Ability One products, and I can go to my iPhone and type in www.walmart.com, and I can see every product that competes against that one. There's no such thing as a closed marketplace. I think people need to figure out how people are buying today and figure out how we're going to make this work for the Ability One program. 
Sorry, we are out of what, time. I'm sorry, what so was I'm the gonna... answer on the block and substitute? I didn't hear the answer. Why, are you guys committed to doing that or no? No. Our, we are testing in this pilot whether we can guide people to these Ability One products through our technology features. But we are not going to remove paper towels that are non Ability One products from our site. What we're testing is if we make this a buying experience where it's easy to find the data, it's easy to compare, it's easy to shop, and I can guide you to these products. And really, it's the first thing you see. We're going to increase sales. That's what we're testing. So if you well, discover that you can't, has there been discussion about what you would do then? Yeah, there would be a discussion between Air Force and the commission and Amazon about what to do. And this well, you, when you can buy something and you just buy it on, off, off the website and you, have, and, and you still have to go to an Ability One website to find this pen. You don't have to go to the Ability One website. It'll be on our site. Okay, so we're, you're going to sell, you're going to pair it with pens that are made in China with prison labor, in Vietnam with child labor. We, how do we know that, you know, in, a, in an age when Bryson shows up at the Pentagon, how do we know we're getting a product that's not going to be coming from some foreign supplier that we don't know the source, we don't know how it's been uh, protected from any, any so type of dangers? We can, we can probably have a conversation offline. Uh, you're the lobbyist for NIB? Yes. Yeah. So you were talking about buying marijuana on... You yes. think Air Thank Force, you. yeah. Marijuana muffins. Yeah, so I don't think people are going to be buying marijuana. I think they're actually going to be wanting to comply with the law. Um, and So I have a different viewpoint of how federal officers operate. Um, but Amazon has lots of measures in place to try to protect against counterfeit items. We will remove sellers from the site if they're selling counterfeit items. We will destroy inventory if it's counterfeit. Um, but what I'm saying is... We will have a link to this landing page that is exclusively for Ability One products. There is that link today. Right. It hasn't launched for precisely this reason. That's what I'm saying is today, when a, when a guy comes back from deployment, a, a supply sergeant, and he gets on his computer with his federal card, he's going to buy what's in front of him. Today, he has the option to go to the Ability One page and buy Ability One products, but it doesn't right. always happen. He's going to buy what's in front of him, and it's going to be Ability One products on the Amazon business site. So you, that, in order to do that, you would have to block and substitute. Nope. See, I think, I think one of the points I was trying to make, too, is that the government is going to have to start learning how to work with online marketplaces. Every federal agency today uses online marketplaces to some extent. I mean, it's going on every day of the week at every federal agency with the purchase cards, especially below the micro-purchase level. So the concerns that you're raising really are concerns for the government, right, to take a look at, because um, the federal government, I think, wants to use online marketplaces for small purchases. It makes sense. It's being done. And the, uh, the challenge really would be how for the government to enforce its, um, its preference for Ability One products. Um, that is a challenge, I think, for the government, not for private industry. Well, in a time when we have... I'd like to give Anne the last things. chance to make one last statement. We're out of time. If she's available after this, you can come and ask more questions. Um, Anne, please go ahead. Oh, wow. How do I close out? Um, <laughs> look, I'm, I'm anxious to launch the pilot and um, to come back, and we'll show you actually how it's working. And Air Force has been absolutely a ter terrific partner in this, as well as the commission. And um, I have a conviction that it's actually going to increase sales. Thank you. Is, is there time for one question that's not related to paper towels? <laughs> <laughs> sure, if it's for Rob Burton, absolutely. Yeah, go for it. Uh, it Burton. Uh, really enjoyed your comments about the 898 panel recommendations. And uh, I come from Service Source, a large ability one services provider, and we do have some concerns about a number of those recommendations. Um, in, in your experience as a senior government DOD official, what, in your view, would be the best way for the ability one program as an industry to push back on some of those things? Um, we if we could reach agreement. Um, or are we, just, are we in the process of getting rolled, and that's just the way it's going? <laughs> well, that's a <laughs> nice way to end. <laughs> well, I did. I, uh, <laughs> I think you need to start with my old office. Tell those folks to get their act together, right? Uh, at the uh, at the Office of Federal Procurement Policy. I mean, that office has enormous influence. That's one thing I learned while I was there, and. I think um, uh, you need to make your concerns known. One thing I n noticed when I was in the government that I did not think 
I'm always found out at the last minute that Source America or Niche back in those days had these concerns that had not really percolated up to my office, and you know I had wished they had come in and talked to me uh, before it got uh, to be a, a problem. And I think communication, I'm a huge believer in communication, uh, just a huge believer in communication, which I, by the way, I, uh, now that I've moved to the private sector, I notice that this is probably the government's greatest challenge is communicating with industry. They don't do it well at all. And um, I think that really our acquisition system suffers because of that. But the government doesn't do a great job of uh, internal communication either. So you do have to advocate for your positions. And um, you know that I think it starts at the Office of Federal Procurement Policy within the federal government. So, yes, ma'am. Uh, no, I just want to um, add to that. Um, the, uh, at the, on October 11th, there's going to be a three-hour webinar scheduled mm, with cool. the Commission and Source America about the Panel 890 um, recommendations. Mm. Um, so, and um, I think tomorrow is the deadline for any questions or concerns to be submitted for that webinar. And then at the NCSE in November, the National Council of Source America Employers um, we meet in Scottsdale. Uh, again, they, they moved an entire morning panel or um, session to, um, to be solely on the 898 recommendations. So there are some opportunities to participate for the MCAs that are here. If you're not signed up to go to either one, either participate in the webinar or the um, NCSC, please do. And then, and then the third thing is that I don't know if any of the other MPAs here, but I've been invited by um, Source America to have my name put forth for a business advisory uh, group at the, the commission level to specifically around the recommendations and all the things. Oh, that's, that's great. Right. That's so great. there's some attempt. <laughs> at least to educate and inform and share. And when there's a, you used an important word there, and, and to the gentleman's concern, educate is, um, I think we, uh, I, I know, I suffered from this when I was in the government. We assume that people understand the concerns. We assume that folks on Capitol Hill will do the right thing. Um, these are not good assumptions. And so I think that, to the gentleman's point, uh, Capitol Hill needs to be educated too, because one thing I did learn while I was in government and also now that I'm in the private sector, there are not many folks up on Capitol Hill that understand the federal procurement. They do not understand it. There are about 10 people on Capitol Hill that have a really good understanding of federal procurement. And so you really do have to educate. Um, and there's a high turnover on Capitol Hill. And so you need to educate these folks as they come in to their positions on Capitol Hill. It's really critical. Thank you, Ann and Thank Rob, you. for joining yeah. us. I really appreciate it. Yeah. I think now we have our three breakout sessions, uh, and the rooms are listed in your program. Uh, there's a mergers and acquisitions panel, a labor and employment panel, and a litigating contract claims panel. <laughs> and the rooms are on the third floor directly upstairs, so the elevator is right outside this door, as are the stairs. We'll direct you. That was awesome. Can I give it a gift? Something from whatever.